Hello everyone and welcome to Playground. Today's video is part one of our introduction to Canvas series that will be continuing throughout several weeks. With that being said, let's get started. Now, once you enter Canvas, you'll see this square box known as a generation frame. This is where all your images will be generated. Underneath is where you'll put a descriptive text known as a prompt. And we're gonna start simple. You simply just have to describe the image that you want. Think of a subject, the background and surroundings, and perhaps an action. In this case, I put cute, adorable raccoon wearing a suit and top hat, reading a newspaper in a cafe. And just below the prompt area, you'll see a generate button, which we'll click on. You'll notice that the generation box moves to the right automatically should you decide to generate another image. To navigate around the canvas is quite simple. You can hold the space bar to move and pan. With the scroll wheel on your mouse, you can scroll up and down. If you hold down shift, you can pan left to right. If you hold down control and scroll, you could zoom in and out. In regards to prompting, we'll go deeper in a future video. But one of the great things about Playground is that we have built-in filters here on the left. If we click on the drop down here on the left, you'll see all these different styles that we can apply to our images. For example, if we wanted to try Bella's Dreamy Stickers, as a result of the filter, we have a sticker style image. This time around, let's try Rev Animated. Now this image looks more like a CGI character. It almost has that Pixar style. This time we'll try Storybook. And you see here we have a very different style, sort of like a watercolor finish. It's a fun filter if you want to do something like children's books, for example. So I encourage you to play around with all the available filters here. Now, one of the things you're gonna find that as you generate more images, you may or may not get the best results. So perhaps you want to delete some images. Let's say I wanna delete this image. Let's zoom in. You'll notice at the top left of the image, there are several icons here. Here you can find your delete button. Simply click on the trash can and we'll delete that image. And in case you've done it accidentally, you can hit Control Z just like any other program, or you could simply click on the image and click delete on your keyboard. Next, we're gonna focus on fine tuning your image. First, let's select a filter here. I'm gonna go with watercolor here. But now I also want to change the dimensions of the image. There's a couple ways we can do this. On the right, you're gonna see image dimensions and you can either use the sliders or enter them manually. You'll also see these two arrows where you could flip the dimensions if you wanted to. To adjust the generation frame manually, if you hold shift and drag these corners, it'll hold the aspect ratio and just increase and decrease the size. But if I let go of shift here, you see that now I can skew the box in more of a freeform way. Let's select four images. And now you'll see three more faded areas here. Let's click generate. And this will allow you to generate four images at a time. Since we applied this watercolor style, you see that it's adopted that style to the image. Let's take a look at the other two. Yeah, I'd be really happy with these images. Let's quickly talk about prompt guidance and quality and details. Now, I'm not gonna go too in depth at this time, but I wanna give you a basic understanding of how this works. If we were to read the description, it says higher values will make your image closer to your prompt. In these examples, I've used a prompt guidance of two, six, 10, 15, and 20. With a prompt guidance of two, you see the colors are muted. It's fairly soft, and this can work depending on the style that you want. With a prompt guidance of six, this is actually a good starting point. Personally, I recommend five to seven to start. You see that there's more contrast and color to the image, and it has a decent amount of sharpness. With a prompt guidance of 10 compared to six, you see the contrast is deeper, and even the depth of field isn't as shallow, whereas here, it's got that background blur, and you'll notice some smaller details have changed as well. In general, any change you make to your settings to your prompt will alter your image ever so slightly. 
With the prompt guidance of 15, now we're starting to lose some detail and it actually looks more like a 2D image, like a drawing or sketch, and some of the details are getting lost. And finally, with a prompt guidance of 20, we've lost all the detail. It pretty much looks like a drawing now, very far from what we're actually looking for. So the higher you go doesn't necessarily mean it's better for your image. In terms of quality and details, we have a quality of 10 and 20 here. Just like the previous example, we see it's a very soft image. And in this case, it's black and white. Whereas with 20, it has enough detail. It's got a decent amount of color. It does look a tad undersaturated. With the quality and details up to 50, now we see a good balance of color, details, and even the facial expression is different. It looks like he's smiling here more than over here. <laughs> Right beside it, we have quality and details generated at 75. If you notice the depth of field isn't as shallow, it does have a bit more contrast in deeper blacks as well. And it's even a bit more saturated. And then quality and details of 100. There really is very little difference between the two. And personally, I found for most people, 50 is a good maximum to stay at. And you're typically only going to use between 30 to 50 in most scenarios. At the highest point, I would say 75, but it will vary between images and your other settings. Moving along, let's talk about seeds. If we read the description here, it says different numbers result in new variations of your image. Right below it, there's this checkbox here and it says randomize seed value to get new variations. So when we generated these four images, this was checked on so that we can come up with some variations. If we uncheck this, you'll see a number that is assigned to this image. It's a random number that the AI generates to do two main things. The first one is to duplicate your image or create slight variations. Let me show you what I mean. So first off, I'm going to grab this image and just bring it down here. We're going to click on this image and on the right, you're going to see an information panel. For now, just hover over seed. You see that there's an option to click to copy. We'll click on the generation box here and uncheck randomize seed value and populate the seed in this area. Let's go ahead and generate the image. Now, as long as the prompt is the same and all the other settings are exactly identical, you should be able to reproduce the exact same image. So if you look at the images side by side, they're exactly the same. Now here's where people glance over the use of seeds. One way you could get different variations is going into the seed and changing some of these numbers. So here we have 42. If I input 43, generate another image. The thing with AI image generation by nature, it's very random. As you can see, we have a very slight variation of this image and we can continue to change these numbers. We can go 44, 45, but this time let's change this three to a four. And now you see we have yet another variation. So just by increasing or decreasing any of these numbers will give you so many different variations. Let's go back to the original seed. Let's say I like this image on the left here, but I want to change the color of his suit jacket. So in the prompt, I'm going to put purple and let's hit generate. Now, instead of a blue suit, he's wearing a purple suit and even the top hat adopted the colors too. The other thing besides color, we could perhaps change his wardrobe in some way. So instead of a top hat, let's put fedora and now he's wearing a fedora. <laughs> Or maybe you want to change the action that the subject is doing. In this case, I'm going to have him drinking some coffee. So it's obvious you can go on and on with little details to slowly shape and mold your image. Now let's talk about samplers. To put it simply, the images are created from a bunch of noise and the samplers are used for denoising. The variance between them aren't that great. It's more the subtle details with the exception of Euler Ancestral and DPM2 Ancestral. If we look at the examples here, I use the same seed, which we just looked at. We have PNDM here, otherwise known as PLMS, DDIM, Euler, Hyun, DPM2, and LMS. At the bottom, we have Euler Ancestral, DPM2 Ancestral. 
If we look at the first three examples here, PLMS, DDIM, and Euler, they're very, very similar. And there really is only a small difference in smaller details. For example, you see the jars here at the back are similar, where PLMS here is slightly different. The details of the newspaper, you can really see the slight differences there. Looking at Hyun DPM2 and LMS. Now, if you were to pixel peep DPM2, for example, maybe slightly sharper or Euler tends to be a little bit softer. If we compare Euler Ancestral, DPM2 Ancestral, both of these look similar in composition and even the style, but there are differences in the color of the tie, the details of the newspaper, but they're both very different from their counterparts above. We do have a detailed video, which I'll leave in the description below. When all is said and done, the differences are negligible. So what I would recommend is using PLMS or DDIM because they're slightly faster and they're great for quick generations. But once you start to dial in those images, you can use either Euler or DPM2. Those tend to be the most popular. I personally like to use Euler Ancestral and DPM2, but it might vary depending on your image and some of the other settings like your prompt guidance and quality and details. It's sort of like a balancing act. Let's go back to the first image here. If you click on the image, you're going to see a secondary menu here. And we've got four options. Earlier, I showed you how to delete your image that way. To the very left, you have a crop option. So let's say I wanted to crop this just a bit tighter. We can go ahead and do that. You can either click done or enter on your keyboard. And if you change your mind and you decide, well, I kind of want to change it back, the original is still accessible. So you could bring it back to the original or crop in a different way. Right beside crop, we have image to image. So we're going to click on that. On the left side panel here, the image has brought into this section called image to image. If I bring the image strength all the way to the left, you see how blurry it gets. That just means you're going to get a greater variance of your image. If I bring it to the right, the variation you get will be closer to the original. So let's set this at 30 to start. And as a result, we see a very similar image in composition. But the details in the suit here are a little bit different. Even the fur on the face, the details in the background. Now, if I were to bring the strength down even more, let's say to 16, and let's generate another image, we see even more variance in the generated image. When it comes down to it, this is a quick way to get variations from your original image, as opposed to using seeds where you can really manipulate the smaller details. The background remover can also be very useful. This time around, we're going to change the prompt to cute, adorable wolf wearing a kung fu suit temple in the background. We're going to choose a dream shaper as our filter and generate an image. Now, let's say I don't like the background. We can go to our remove background option here. Click on that. You can see that we've removed the background. It might not be perfect all the time. We can easily zoom in here and delete the remnants. I'm going to hit E on my keyboard to call up the eraser tool. I'm doing this really quick, but I do encourage you to take your time. You can always access the simple eraser from the top menu here. I'm going to create another background. The prompt's very simple, Pixar style temple in the background and I can do some simple compositing. You'll notice as I slide this guy over here, we need to bring the character to the front. If you right click on the image, you see that you have options bring to front and bring to back. So we're gonna hit bring to front, move him over here and resize accordingly. Obviously we'd have to work on the lighting and all that stuff, but this is just a quick example to show you what else we can do with the tools. If we right click again, we have more options. We can lock the image. So now I can't move anything. Let's unlock that. We can flip horizontally or vertically. There's an option to use as control traits, which has to do with control nets. We won't cover that today, but I will reference a video in the description below. There's also an option to upscale. However, we can't do that because the assets are separate. So one way around that is that if you drag on the canvas and select both assets, right click and hit copy, 
right click on the canvas to paste. And now you see the image has been flattened into one. So here you see they're separate assets. Here they're put together. So if we right click upscale by four, we can do that as well. There's also a download option here. So if you click on download, you could save it to your computer locally and another way to delete. Alternatively, we also have a copy button here on the right panel and a download button. We'll look at publish later on. Moving forward, I wanted to show you the right panel option. So if you're not on the move or select tool, you can click on it here at the top. Shortcut key is V. If we were to click on the image here, you see on the right panel, we have all this information. At the top is a history of the prompt of that image. And you can also click on this icon to copy it. And if your prompt's a little long, you could simply click on here and you'll see that it's collapsible. We also have our negative prompts and all the details of that image from the dimensions that we used, the model, sampler, everything else. Towards the bottom are some basic editing tools with opacity, brightness, contrast, and saturation. Now, one of the most powerful things about Canvas is the ability to outpaint. And all that means is that you can extend an image. Simply hit G to call up the generation box. And we're gonna change our dimensions to 512 by 512. I wouldn't really recommend going any higher than that, just because you wanna work in little sections at a time. And the way this works is that you simply put your generation box in an area where you want to extend the image. I like to keep about half of the image within the generation box, just so you can give the AI some information. We're gonna go ahead and click generate. And you see now the image is extending. We'll move the generation box to finish off this corner here. Let's do the left side of the image now. And if we do a quick side-by-side -side comparison here, you see that we've extended the image even more. Another useful feature that Canvas has is the object eraser. If we go to the top menu here and select the object eraser, shortcut key is shift E. We can use this to remove unwanted objects in the image. For example, on the left corner here, I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> so we're gonna remove that. You'll see an option to click on erase. And let's say we wanted to even remove this cup. We simply just have to mask the area to remove the object. Now there is some traces of it here, so we can try to use the object eraser once again. Yeah, that took care of it. Even down below here, there's some remnants from last time. We can delete that. Now you could continue to further extend this image if you wanted to. You could even regenerate certain areas. Let's say I don't like this area here. I'm gonna call up my eraser tool by hitting E on my keyboard. And we're just gonna simply delete this section here and try to come up with something nicer. You can bring the generation box just a tad smaller. And again, I like to leave a lot of detail on this side and work in small chunks. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. And there you go. So if there's certain things in your image you don't like, you can really manipulate it in many different ways. Assuming you're happy with this image and you wanna do some final touches, maybe you wanna bring the brightness brighter or make it slightly darker. In my case, I like the way it is. Perhaps you want to adjust the contrast slightly just to give it some deeper blacks, or you can adjust the saturation to get just a bit more pop from those colors. And then once you're done, click on publish. You can write a caption here, and then you'll see a checkbox here if you want it to go public in your profile gallery, or leave it off if you want it to be private. Click on publish, and you'll get a notification that the image has been published. You can click on copy link to share it via email, DM, or you can click on view image and it'll take you to your profile gallery. You'll get a summary of your image with all the details. And if we click out of here, we now see the image in my profile gallery. So there you have it, everyone, our overview of Playgrounds Canvas. Now, stay tuned, as I said, we're gonna dive deeper into some other features that we have like draw to edit, control net, instruct to edit. There's a lot that we need to cover. Until then, this is Playground.